I want you to open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 8. We're heading into a new chapter. Um, We're a loving community growing with Christ. That's really the heart of who we are. And we want to see people grow in their faith, whether they're toddlers or fifth graders, seventh graders. And we're grateful to see that God is working in the lives of our high schoolers this morning. Grateful for your investment in their lives. And uh, Tara and I are grateful for your investment in us. This is a family. I want you to look around. Just take a look around. There's all different ages, all different cultures. We're a family. That's what the church is supposed to be. It's not a business. It's not an event. It's a family. And so we become who God has called us to be when we start thinking through that lens. Family. We're a family. So grateful that you're here. We're going to be reading from Mark chapter 8, 1 through 10. We hope that you'll use the questions at the bottom of the message insert to answer and to facilitate uh, God's ultimate question in our lives. What is Jesus, Jesus changing for us? The title of this message is Impact. Turn to your neighbor and say Impact. And the question for us this morning as we think about the text is, can we impact people's lives if we don't have compassion? The other day, we participated in a serve day. We partnered with multiple churches here in Costa Mesa to meet the needs of people in Costa Mesa. Trellis was kind of the sponsoring organization, but there were a lot of churches that participated. Um, A lot of cool stories that happened through that. And uh, the project that I was a part of was a prayer walk. And we were walking at strategic points throughout Costa Mesa to pray. And uh, prayer is so important. It opens doors that uh, can't be open for us without prayer. It facilitates the movement of God. Uh, and, and a huge privilege of what God has called us to be a part of in the transformation of the world is by praying, just being a part of that conversation with the Lord. And so we stopped at strategic locations. And as we passed the bus stop, I noticed a guy who looked a little down and out. And I just kept on walking. I noticed him, but I kept on moving. Have you ever noticed someone noticed a need, and kept on moving. I was kind of towards the back of the group of 20 people that were praying, and I mean the Holy Spirit hit me in the back of the head like a dad hits his son when he burps at the kitchen table, right? That's how I felt. I would not have stopped unless I felt that. And the Holy Spirit said, I want you to pray for him. I said, well, I am praying for him. (laughs) I'm praying for the whole city. And the Holy Spirit said, no, I want you to pray with him. And I said, okay. And I stopped, and the rest of the group kept walking. And I knelt down, and I looked him in the eye and said, are you okay? Can I pray for you? And he told me that he was at a recovery home. He got kicked out, and he was literally hopeless that morning as he was trying to figure out where to go, what to do because a lot of his belongings had been stolen during the night. Just in that moment, praying for the city missed the face. And I prayed with him because I didn't have any cash on me or food on me. But at the end of the prayer, he looked at me and said, I needed to know that God hasn't forgotten about me. And the bus pulled up literally like in that moment. He jumped on it, and I have no idea where he went. And I can only tell you that that happened because God loves people so much. Not because I love people, because I would have walked right on by that guy. But he grabbed my attention. Can we have impact on people's lives without compassion causing us to do more than just notice people? Is noticing people enough? What has God called Newport Mesa Church to be? What's he called you to be? Who has he called you to be? We're going to just allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us from Mark 8 this morning. Verse 1 starts in those days when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat. He called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? I think a lot of times we are more focused on the circumstance than the ability of God to do anything that he wants to do. The immensity of need can cause apathy in our heart, can't it? 
And he asked them, how many loaves do you have? They said, seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves. And having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces, left over seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away and immediately got into the boat with his disciples and went to the, disciple, uh, to the district of Dalmanutha. Father, I just pray that you'd speak to us today. God, we recognize that we've got a lot of different ages in our congregation this morning. We're grateful for the ninth graders who are with us this morning, the 10th graders, the 11th graders, and the 12th graders. God, it's not lost on me that your disciples were probably their age. that you chose them because they were ready to learn, ready to walk with you. And Father, they changed the world because of what you did in their hearts. So Lord, I pray that you would do that in our hearts. Give our hearts uh, an ability to grasp what your spirit is doing in this season. We don't want to be old wineskins. We want to have new wineskins, which is just flexibility, humility, readiness for whatever it is that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the things that I love about God is that he is compassionate. I know that it might not feel like that all the time because of our situation, because of what we see happening in the world. But if you look in Scripture, you will find a God that not only notices but does something. And that's really the biblical definition of compassion, that it's not just sympathy or empathy, it causes there to be a response. That's what biblical compassion is. Biblical compassion is responding to the physical needs that you see. And God notices suffering. He notices it in your life and he notices it in the world. He notices the orphan, the widow. He notices the poor and the jobless. Our Father notices the addicted, the oppressed. God notices the depressed. He notices the sick. He notices the hungry. He notices the homeless. He notices the refugee. He cares about people who have been displaced by war and violence. He notices the immigrant. He notices the vulnerable, the exploited, the prisoner. He notices the abused, the unreached, the uninvited. God notices the lost, the alienated, and the social outcasts, and a whole host of other categories of which all of us have been labeled and categorized at some point in our lives. Isn't that our story? That God noticed us. And he didn't just notice us, he did something about it. I want to encourage you this morning, if you feel unnoticed by God in your circumstance, in your situation, that God isn't just noticing you. He sees you, but he wants to reach you right where you are. God does something. And the biblical idea of compassion, if we were to really follow Jesus, would be to respond to what we're noticing. In fact, the ultimate expression of compassion in Scripture is when the Father sent the Son to become human, to enter into our existence, to identify with our pain. That's what we talked about last week when Jesus spit and touched the guy's tongue. He got down there in the grit and the dirt with him. And this is what Jesus has done for all of us. And in this story, you'll notice the same thing. That even in the midst of your own hunger, your own need for lunch, that if you would be willing to give God what he's asking, to allow him to channel through you his heart, you will find life. Because the path to eternal life 
is found through the way that Jesus lived, culminating in his own death on the cross. This is why Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Live your life the way I lived it. Have you noticed that there's two different moments in Jesus' ministry where he feeds a lot of people? Right? The first one was Mark 6, 30 through 44. How many of you are here in the sermon titled Multiplied Ministry? It specifically references the compassion of Jesus, but not in the way that most of us connect the dots. He says that he had compassion on the people because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And his response was not to feed them. His response was to teach them. See, the greatest thing, that the most compassionate thing that we can do as a church is to introduce people to the teachings of Jesus. Because Jesus addresses people at the soul level. But then there's this story. And the emphasis is in a different place. He had been teaching for three days, but it says his compassion is on something else. If you notice how Jesus notices that they are hungry. His disciples are freaking out because even though they have already seen him feed the 5,000, apparently they have spiritual amnesia. They have already forgotten about it. (laughs) And Jesus, Jesus notices their hunger, their physical hunger. And just like God the Father, who notices when we're in pain, who notices our suffering, Jesus does something about it. And he has compassion on the crowds because of their physical hunger. See, compassion notices and responds to people's physical needs. And Jesus responded to the physical needs after he had been teaching them because he simply cared for them. He cared about where they were and what they were struggling with. My question for our congregation today is how many loaves do we have? In Costa Mesa, Newport Beach, Orange County, wherever you are in the life of your story, how many loaves do you have? That is Jesus' way of asking, what's our situation? (laughs) What is it that we're noticing that we have access to be a part of the solution for? Because people are hurting all around us. I remember one of the very first Sundays of coming to this church, I uh, heard about this thing that this church does called Feeding the Hungry. How many of you have ever met Orlando Sanchez? He's got his refrigerated truck outside because he's going to be a part of something that you can participate in after the service. I went to the Feeding the Hungry event, and I met a gal who responded to John's salvation call. And we were able to pray with her. What's hilarious, not hilarious, but it's not lost on me, is every time I speak with this woman, who has since become very involved in our church. (laughs) In fact, she's a part of our communion team. She serves, and she's found... Christ meet her, way, meet her needs in some pretty incredible ways. She said there was a comment by John that when he spoke that over her, it changed everything. In that moment, God gave John White a word of knowledge for her. And as she's been involved in the life of our church, she's really grown. In the Colossians series, she came up to me and said, Pastor, I feel uh, like that God is calling me to not have tarot cards anymore. I'm not supposed to be uh, doing this, you know, seeking... Uh, the future outside of what I I sense and know that God is speaking to me. I said, that's awesome. It's just crazy what God does through the preaching of God's word and, and just an environment that pours love and grace into people and the truth of God's word and, and how the Holy Spirit empowers transformation in people's lives. I was able to go to a graduation just this last year where she had uh, graduated from a chef school called Open Gate. There's this organization in here in Costa Mesa called Open Gate. And Open Gate is an organization that gives people practical training for people who are looking for a second chance. And she was able to graduate. And what was so cool is she got a job that is a significant pay increase for her. And she is really on her way to becoming financially secure. She was homeless when we met her at the Feeding Hungry event, and God has, in a, in a journey in her life, used all sorts of people from the church to speak and to minister and to raise her up. Not to give her a handout, but to give her a hand up. You see, compassion 
doesn't just notice where people are and their pain. The kind of compassion that Jesus has for us gives us a hand up out of our situation. And as we learn to lean on his strength and depend on his word, God changes things for us. And the kind of church that I see Newport Mesa Church becoming is a church that is totally spirit-led like that, where we're listening to God. It's based in Scripture. It's mission-driven, where young families are everywhere, and there's little kids, and there's old people, and the wisdom of the generations is passed on, and there's all cultures. It's diverse. People ask. They say, Jordan, that's too broad. No, it's not. That's the kingdom. The kingdom is just opening up your doors and saying, Jesus is here with us. Why don't you hang out? (laughs) Because wherever Jesus is, there's always going to be enough food. There's always going to be enough of his word to go around. There's always going to be enough of his presence. God is leading our congregation. You may not trust him all the time, and I'll just tell you that I don't trust him all the time. (laughs) Sometimes I'm pushed to that precipice wondering, God, what in the world have you really called Tara and I to? We're trying to figure it out. And I can't help but relate to these disciples who are probably the age of our youth ministry students. (laughs) Peter was probably the oldest, and he was only old because we know that he had to pay the tax when he asked Jesus about the tax. Otherwise, Jesus was literally the first youth pastor. And I relate to the question that Jesus poses to them. What are we supposed to do? I, I don't know. What are, how are we supposed to trust God for this? What are we supposed to do? A, as I evaluate what it is that we have in our capacity to, to move around, I, I, I just want to think through kind of where we're at. That question, how many loaves do you have, is kind of a, a question that encourages me to kind of just check out what's happening. My hope is that this kind of church extends not just from our neighborhoods, but it goes to the nations. And really, it all starts with this worship gathering in this moment. We're the church scattered, but when the church is gathered together, we represent God's spirit in a unique way. And we've gathered around really four promises that you see in Exodus 6, know God, find freedom, discover purpose, make a difference, which are the markers for what it looks like to follow Jesus. So if we're going to grow with Christ, we've got to know God if, through him. If we're going to find freedom, we've got, through Christ, we've got to really pursue Holy Spirit empowerment to be free from the things that have kept us in bondage. I believe that God wants all of us to discover purpose and mostly make a difference. Because when God works in us, he's going to release us to make a difference wherever we are. And that's why it hurt so bad when the Holy Spirit knocked on the back of my neck walking in front of that bus stop. Because you can be a church in a community and be totally unknown and make no difference, make no impact. You might notice people, but if you haven't been instigated into action, then what is really the purpose of all that God is doing in us? And that's what these worship gatherings are all about. We have 52 Sundays a year to give people Jesus so that people can know God. That's why we worship. That's why we study scripture. That's why we invite people into relationship with Christ. This is why we have groups where people have the relational stability and the accountability to find freedom in their lives. And we invite people to serve on teams. Things like financial peace. Things like Royal Family Kids Camp. This summer, we do a camp for hurting kids, and it's a great way to reach people right where they're at. Kids who are hurting in the foster care system, many of them have never even had a birthday party. And God uses the church, specifically this one, to connect with them. And so many other ways to make a difference. I mentioned Orlando earlier. Do you know that Orlando Sanchez gives away 300 tons of food every year? Did you know that that happened on that parking lot at the second sun- Saturday of every single month, it's hard to communicate all of the different things that are happening in the church. <laughs> but there's lots of ways that you can show compassion, that you can get involved, that you can be a part of what God is doing to meet the needs of people if you will just say yes. It's been awesome to see Orlando minister beyond just 
that Saturday and go into the neighborhoods. He's developed relationships with so many of the neighborhoods here in Costa Mesa. And we partner with other uh, organizations like Trellis and Teen Challenge and Pregnancy Care Centers and MICA and, and different ways for us to just be channels of God's compassion on people's lives. This last week, I was able to hear about this new adventure happening with the Assemblies of God in the Southern California District called City Serve. And it's not just going to be here, but this is where it's starting. They've literally gotten contracts with Costco and Home Depot to set up five warehouses all across Southern California to give away the takebacks as churches partner with them to learn how this wouldn't just be giving away stuff, but as a, as a bridge, as an avenue to build relationships with people into their lives just to meet needs. Can you imagine? There's going to be 40 semi-loads a month meeting the needs of people. Newport Mesa has an opportunity to be a part of that. If we choose, if we want, we know the need in our area. Is that something that God is speaking to you about? I'd love to be a, a pod which serves these different five hubs as a way to bridge some of these amazing blessings through Orlando's ministry, through the Saturday ministry. I want to be a church that makes an impact in Orange County. I can't do it alone. Jesus can't do it alone. It absolutely needs you. Thank you, Jesus. I want to be a church that spreads Christ's compassion to the nations. And some of us are able to go on missions trips, and we do take missions trips. We went to South Africa, and different people have gone on short-term trips. But the primary way that we impact nations is by partnering and by giving. We support 67 missionaries at the cost of almost 10000 a month. Last year when I was doing some studies on tithing, I realized I discovered that our church could give about $180,000 more to missions every month if we tithe. Isn't that crazy? I think of all the major issues in the world, and I just think, what could God's people do if we just gave, if we got connected, if we got unified? And God hasn't called us to be the church that rallies every church in the world, but he has called us to do what he's called us to do. That's why we partner with missions organizations and Bible schools and Convoy of Hope, which is disaster relief and social justice causes and sex trafficking and church plants. We built a church in Haiti last year that needed a foundation. We we're blessed to be able to give them an offering of $50,000 about two years ago. But today I want to introduce you to something that I've referenced a few times. UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, said this, Syria is the biggest humanitarian and refugee crisis of our time, a continuing cause of suffering for millions which should be garnering a groundswell of support around the world. World Vision is one of the largest humanitarian organizations in the world. And they are one of the partners of our network. And it's one of the partners that we went to Lebanon with. And we saw, I saw firsthand what ISIS has done. And in that country alone, there are 2 million Syrian refugees worldwide. There are 13 million people who have been displaced because of the war in the Middle East. Worldwide, there are 65 million refugees. I'd like you to watch this video. <laughs> she went to an airplane.
She went to an airplane. What was she doing with this There are moments that we look out in the world and we're overwhelmed by the need. And for me, going to Lebanon was totally overwhelming. This was a, a center where just outside of one of the temporary tent settlements was a, a ministry outreach center. And the Korean missionaries there are partnering with Chinese mis missionaries, which that's a Chinese missionary. Chinese missionaries know what persecution feels like. And they have come in alongside of, and they are teaching some of the Syrian refugees how to make soap, giving them a real life practical skill to be able to earn money. This is a family from Tripoli that is a part of a church that has, has been built on the northern border of Syria, and these Lebanese people are ministering to the Syrian refugees as they're coming in. What I love about this picture is it doesn't communicate to me the immensity of the need. It communicates the joy of the Lord. It was a beautiful encouragement. This is a tent settlement where we heard... A World Vision employee talk about the process of getting clean water and food and cash assistance. And you can see what a typical tent settlement looks like. These are three little girls that I visited at one of the schools that World Vision is, has created to help bridge these kids into life beyond the craziness of what they have seen. They said that the first week is just a lot of crying because these kids have a really difficult time processing all of the violence that they've seen already as small children. And then they get to a point where they begin to trust and they begin to be kids again, learning how to play, things like playing and the importance of playing. And the woman next to her is a woman I've referenced. Her name is Samuda. She has five kids. She has no idea where her oldest five are. The oldest two of the second five are in Turkey. And then she has three daughter, two daughters and a son, Amira, Hala, and Bashir. Bashir is 11. He works in the fields for a couple dollars a day working 12-hour shifts. And unless they get education, there really isn't 
a whole lot of hope for them because of the cascading impact of what this displacement has created for them. Now, I don't know about you, when I think about any world issue, and whether it's the homeless in Costa Mesa or the 65 million refugees that exist around the world that God loves, I get totally overwhelmed to the point where I notice it, but I keep walking just because I don't know how to meet that need. And I think this story gives us all we need to know what God has called us to do. And it's found in that question. How many loaves do you have? <laughs> Which is actually irrelevant. It's irrelevant. It's only relevant because God has invited us into the solution. The relevant truth for us to fall into, to rest in, to build a ministry on is it doesn't matter how many loaves you have. I'm still going to feed these people with whatever you give me. Seven loaves is enough and a few small fish because God cares about the needs of people. As a response and as an encouragement to us to respond to this, I, I want to encourage you to make compassion a part of your everyday life by doing a couple things. First, Orlando's out in the back our, by our patio, and he's got enough cliff bars for everyone to take one home. So there's a range here that we're going to give people opportunity to respond with. There are days that I pass people that I would love to be able to just give something to, and I just feel like that's something that we can do. We can put a cliff bar in our pocket or in the dash of our car. We can create a little compassion kit. And we can just meet the needs of people when we see them. Just simple, very simple. I'm not asking that you alleviate homelessness by doing that. But it's something and you can get down to where people are and look them in the eye. And you can hear their story. And you can remind them that God sees them. And this won't matter as much as that. I promise you that. That's one way. Another way is you can be a part of what Orlando does once a month at the second Saturday of the month. Beyond that, you can go into the neighborhoods with him. Maybe you really do have a heart to meet people's needs. There's a lot of needs in Costa Mesa and around Orange County that you could be a part of if you were open. And finally, I would love to see our church have a compassion team. A couple of weeks ago, we went up to a church in Whittier, Tara and I, and they have this whole compassion ministry where on Sunday morning, not a separate thing, but Sunday morning, you can come worship with us because of what that communicates. You're family. You're not separate. You're family, and we can meet needs. If that's something that, that you have a passion for, that you want to brainstorm, I would love for you to set up an appointment with Chris Duncan and talk about what that could look like. And then... I think the best way to apply this to our life is to give. We can't solve the immigration problem with one offering, and no one's saying we will. But I do think as we give, our hearts will be drawn into this thing that God is doing. I know my math is off. It says 15,000 plus 30,000 equals 50,000, but let me explain. <laughs> I really am bad at math, so don't be surprised. I want to do something this year that we've never done. I want to give VBS away. For free. I want to totally give it away. Typically it, talks, it costs about 50 bucks. We don't have it in our budget to give it away. So this is a part of how we're going to respond this morning in our neighborhoods. By giving VBS away. And our goal is to have 300 kids at VBS this year, which will require you not just to give, but to invite those little ankle biters in your neighborhood to hear about Jesus. <laughs> we want to love them, and we want to show them Christ's love. So that's going to be a part of the next four weeks as we give in this special offering at the end of our service for the next four weeks, is we're going to give VBS away. It's going to cost us about $15,000. The at each VBS, there's a missions cause. 
And this year, our VBS students are going to give towards Syrian refugees. Now, the last two years, they have raised funds for uh, homes in Haiti. Last year, they raised funds for uh, kids in Africa who need clean drinking water. And two years ago, they raised 3000 Last year, they raised 5000 And our goal is that they would be able to contribute the missing $5,000 towards the ultimate of this. Can you imagine our kids are going to raise $5,000? I believe they will. They're going to sell lemonade. They're going to, just because kids have so much faith, they'll just do it. Jesus is like, how many loaves do you have? We have 5,000 loaves, Jesus. <laughs> like, they're going to go for it. So if you need faith, just interview my daughter. She'll show you. She's not quite there, but she'll be there in a year. And so they're going to provide 5000 And then the remaining $30,000, and I broke it down so that you could see what this looks like, is that we would send 300 kids in Lebanon in the Becca Valley to school for 12 weeks. I know it doesn't solve the problem. <laughs> Have you ever asked yourself, why did Jesus take this moment to feed these people in this one moment? It, we don't know what happens after that. <laughs> Just because he's showing them that he cares. And I think the greatest thing that we can do is serve and to give and to show that we care. The cool thing, though, about this opportunity to give is that it's a part of a greater project, partnering with all of the churches in Southern California to give towards this cause. So while we are focusing more on the educational aspect of it, with schools and the mobile clinic and the school supplies, which will include lunch and outreaches to their parents and transportation to and from their temporary tent settlements. We'll also be a part of anti-trafficking ministry and rescuing women in Europe and, and the impact of all of these refugees with nothing and very vulnerable into some of these European countries. And then we'll be helping with building the church in Tripoli. Now you're sitting there thinking, man, this sounds like more like a mission service. Yeah, that's what it is. It's a mission service. We're a missions church. We care about the mission locally. We care about the church globally. We want God's compassion to be felt in our neighborhoods, and we want God's compassion to be felt in the nations. One of the biggest things happening in the world right now is displaced people, and we're going to give to it. So we're going to try to raise 50 grand in the next four weeks. I know we can do it. I have faith that we can do it. If our worship team could come forward, uh, Tara and I were talking about this last night, um, and there's different ways that you can give over the course of the next four weeks, but you can certainly take a picture of that, and as you talk and pray and process this with the Lord, you'll be able to figure out you know, what it is that God wants you to do. As God asks you that question, how many loaves do you got? But as we talked about it, we just felt like this is a moment where, where we really, you know, we support kids through World Vision and we give to the missions fund here and we tithe and we do those things. And we have experienced God's blessing in incredible ways. We're debt free. We, we, we purchased a house here in Orange County last year. Like I would be the first to tell you that you cannot outgive God. It's just impossible. He owns everything. How can you outgive God? The one who owns everything. I mean, it's like he can cre- seven loaves and he feeds 4,000 people. Like, think about that. <laughs> think about that. We just felt like this is a cause that's worthy of for us. If we told you how much we were giving, maybe, maybe you would say, oh, my goodness, that's crazy. Or maybe you would say, man, that's not very much at all. I don't know. It just, it's just a number. <laughs> but it's the biggest number that we've ever given to a single cause. And we want to make a dent. We want to make an impact. More than anything, we want our hearts to be impacted by what obviously impacts Christ. This little guy is named Amir. We saw him at the tent settlement, and he followed us around, and (laughs) it's crazy how much joy he had. And you find and discover that no matter where you go, people are resilient, especially kids. (laughs) Amir was excited to see us and sad to see us go and we hugged him and and he went off on his journey we were given really 
specific instructions not to give money to anyone in these 10 settlements because it would jeopardize the work that World Vision was doing by changing the formula, you know? They, they really work hard at helping people have dignity. Funny thing happens when you lose dignity. You get desperate. When you have dignity, you're not as desperate because there's something that just keeps you believing even when your circumstances are crazy. And someone said something on that trip that I will never forget. And I think about Amir whenever I think about this statement. If people, not just Christians, but if people in the world do not give these kids something to live for, they will discover something to die for. Jesus, you died so that we don't have to. Jesus, you died for Amir. You died for me. And it's the overflow of what God has done in my life that causes me to give joyfully to things that I will never solve but will keep me locked into God's heart until he solves them. Compassion is one of the greatest opportunities for not just Newport Mesa Church, but any church, any person, anywhere to make a lifelong impact on someone's life. I don't wanna just challenge you to go grab a cliff bar. I wanna challenge you to ask God how many loaves he's asking you to give. This might have nothing to do with you, and for most of us, it really doesn't. And yet, all of us are spiritual refugees until we find our home in Christ. And how many lives could be impacted forever if our church raises 50,000 plus to minister to 300 kids this summer at Vacation Bible School and 350 or more children who have been displaced by war, war, who all they want to do is go back to Syria. But hopefully in the midst of this chaos, we'll find Christ because they'll get curious about that little logo on their tents, which has a cross on it in 99% Muslim areas. They'll get curious. And when they do, they're going to discover a people who were generous when they didn't need to be because someone was generous for us when God could have just left us be on our own, but he didn't. He said, I see the hunger. I see it, and I can meet that need. And he meets that need through us. If you feel like God is asking you to give, I'm not asking you how much. I'm saying he's asking you to give. It might be a dollar. Maybe you've never given to church, and this is your first step, or $10, or $100, or 1000 or 10000 If you feel called to give $1 or anything, I'd like you to stand up right now as a response, as a moment where God can say, okay, I see your heart, and I'm going to multiply what I place in your heart so that this goal, which some of you may think is small and some of you may think is huge, can be met. And we can give towards this need so that little guys like Amir can experience health and wholeness and the opportunity to learn more about the most compassionate Jesus that has ever walked the face of this planet. I want to just take a few moments and let the Holy Spirit speak to us as our worship team.